Good evening and welcome to the week seven lecture video. Let's go ahead and look at the agenda. I'll share that with you. Okay, so here's our agenda. So as always, I've uh, published a worship video for you. So if you look under the week seven module, you'll see that video. So I do encourage you to uh, watch it. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for every day that you give us. We realize that it is a blessing. It is an opportunity to do what you have called us here to do. Lord, give us the wisdom to always turn to you and to seek you first and your will. Lord, we, we thank you for this opportunity to have this class. It is, it is truly a unique opportunity to be able to pray at a university. Lord, it's truly a unique opportunity to take a research methods class, to learn how to write a research paper, to learn research methodology, to learn or review, learn slash review SPSS and statistical interpretations. Lord, we, we praise you for that. Lord, we understand that you brought us here for a reason. And we ask you for strength to finish strong. We ask you for strength to understand why you have put us here. We ask you to connect us to what you want us to get out of this class for your will. And in that spirit, Lord, we dedicate this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, as always, I like to go over the three prongs of this class because it's so important. The first prong is theory. You're getting research methodology theory by reading the textbook by taking the quizzes and by us reviewing the quizzes and me providing commentary when I feel that it's uh, necessary. Certain things I'm not an expert in, so I won't talk about them. Prong two, SPSS, you have a great opportunity, or you had, because we're done with those assignments now, to just watch the SPSS lecture videos. You weren't doing the analyses, but you were focusing on the interpretations, because as you figured out, you needed to know those interpretations for your results section. So hopefully those videos have helped you to that end. The third prong is the research paper, okay? And all these lectures are mainly focused on helping you figure out the components of the research paper, giving you an opportunity to practice through discussion forums, and then to submit rough drafts for me to give you feedback. So that's how I designed the class. I feel like it's pretty solid, uh, especially in this eight week period. So you all have done a lot of good work, so just finish strong. So that's my, that's my message for you today. Let's go ahead and look at quiz six topics 56 through 66. In a single group design in which treatments are alternated, ABAB -A -B design, what is the purpose of conducting multiple initial observations before any treatment is given? And the whole point of this is to establish a baseline for comparison to the post-treatment, okay? You have a baseline, okay? Then you do the treatment, you measure again, and then as you retest, you compare that to the baseline. That's the whole idea. What is, a, uh, what is a confound in an experimental study? An extra variable that could explain result differences between groups. And again, when we're talking about random assignment, the confound that we talked about, I believe it was either week one or week two, the confound that we talked about was conscientiousness. Okay, If you didn't use random assignment and you just took the first 50 people who came to the study door and you threw them in the treatment, okay, you took this second 50 and you threw them in the control, your confound would be conscientiousness because now those receiving the treatment are also those who are the most conscientious. And how do we know this? Because they showed up early 
Whereas the other 50, they showed up late, or sorry, later or late. So then if you would find the difference, as I was saying, between the treatment and the control group on the outcome, was it due to the treatment or was it due to the fact that people in the treatment were high in conscientiousness compared to people in the control who were low in conscientiousness? So that's a great example of the confound. Which type of statistics helps researchers to estimate the effects of sampling errors on their results? Okay, inferential statistics. We use inferential statistics to make a statement about a larger population based on our sample data. Okay, so we have personality and gay marriage attitudes data. Okay, the analyses probably have about 500 participants in them. Okay, is that the population? No, it's a sample, but we're trying to make a statement about a larger population, whether you think that's uh, California, the United States or the world, we're trying to make a statement about a larger population based on these 500 uh, participants who participated in our study, personality and gay marriage attitudes. If a researcher asks participants to name the country in which they were born, the researcher is using which scale of measurement? This is nominal. You can't rank countries. I guess you can rank them based on maybe uh, uh, gross domestic product, right, GDP, but really the country is going to be a nominal variable. And what does that mean? Uh, other, other nominal variables would be gender, right? And we've, we've talked about this when we looked at personality and gay marriage attitudes. Can you write gender? Are males one and females two? Well, you quantify those, those labels, if you will, like you assign males one females two just to do analyses but it doesn't mean that males are number one and females are number two other nominal variables so i talked about gender there is a uh, race uh, religious affiliation so i think you get it when reporting a percentage it is a good idea to also rep report the underlying case number yeah exactly okay if, if you're if you're saying uh, you know uh, set seventy five percent of the uh, respondents uh, seventy five percent of the 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 female uh, respondents uh, exhibited the self esteem score higher than the national average. Okay. Okay. Oh wow. So that must mean, you know, most females, so 75% have self-esteem above the national average. I'm kind of just making this up right now. Well, it would probably be less meaningful if 75% if would be three females because you actually asked four females. <laughs> you see what I mean? So it's, in, and I think it would be more impactful if, if in, instead of, uh, one female scoring below the national average and three scoring above the national average, which that would be 75, I think would be more impactful if it was 1,000 females that scored below the national average and 3,000 that it scored above the national average, right? So it's always, a, the whole idea here is you want to report the actual numerical count and the percentage, right? Because if your counts are low, then you know, percentages can be misleading. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Which of the following is the name of the curve that is symmetrical? Okay, this is a normal curve, okay? A distribution is normally distributed, okay? If the mean and the median are equal to each other, okay? And it looks like a bell, okay? If a, if a distribution is positively skewed, Okay, the tail is pointing to the left. Uh, the mean is further to the left and the, the median is closer to the center. Okay, the, so that would be negatively skewed. I said that right. Okay, and, and then if a distribution is positively skewed, the tail of the distribution is pointing to the right. The mean is being pulled towards the right and uh, the median is closer to the center. Which of the following is useful for describing the averages of skewed distributions, uh, the median, okay? Yeah, this is, this is important. And I actually believe I covered it in an SPSS 
lecture video. Okay, it's the idea that the the median is less reactive to an extreme value than the mean. Okay, if if you take an average of uh, the values one, two, three, four, and five million. Okay, so you could do that at home. You're going to get a really large number. Okay, so again, you could take the average of literally one, two, three, four, and five million. Okay, so that average would be huge. I, I'm assuming it would be a few million. Okay, whereas the median would be what? The median's the middle number, one, two, three. So the median would be three. Well, that three better represents one, two, three, four, and five million, because five million seems like an outlier. Two groups can have the same mean but different standard deviations. Yes. Okay. They're 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 different, right? And a good example of that is if if you have uh if you have a distribution that's Five, 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 and you take an average, what are you going to get? Five, <laughs> right? What's the standard deviation going to be? Zero. Why is the standard deviation zero? Because all the values are the same, okay? Because the standard deviation is the average deviation of each score away from the mean, okay? So that's just one example. And then you can have something like... Uh, I believe if you if you have uh, one, two, three, four, five. Anyway, just you can have a mess of a mess of numbers that aren't all the same that come up to a mean of five, but because the numbers are deviating around the mean, you're actually going to have a standard deviation. Okay, whereas if all the numbers were the same, same or standard deviation zero. So that's kind of a way to prove that. What is the interquartile range? The interquartile range is the range of the middle 50% of the distribution. Okay. So, and a good way to do that, I don't know. Uh, I, I believe I talked about it in my lecture video, but you probably remember this from stats. If you look at a, a, a box plot, and I don't have a picture with me right now, but the minimum to the Q1 is 25% of the data. The Q1 to the Q2 is 25% of the data, okay? The Q2 to the Q3 is 25% of the data. And the Q3 to the Q, <laughs> sorry, the Q3 to the max is 25% of the data. So what did I do? Min to the Q1, or the first quartile is 25%. Q1 to the Q2 is 25%. Q2 to the Q3 is 25%. Q3 to the max is 25%. Well, what's the interquartile range? The interquartile range is Q3 minus Q2. So what's in between Q, what's in between, sorry, the interquartile range is uh, Q3 minus Q1, okay? So so Q3, so 25%, 25%. So if, if you do that, and you you take uh, it would help if I had a, uh, it would help a little more if I had a picture, but I think you get it. it if you take Q three minus Q one, what's Q three? So Q Q three. Let's do it this way. Q three at Q three, seventy five percent of the scores in the distribution are below Q three, twenty five percent are above. Okay. If you subtract Q one, Q one saying twenty five percent of the scores in the distribution are below. 75% or above. So Q3 is 75% minus 25%, and now you're getting the middle 50% of the data. Which of the following is used to describe the statistical significance of results? That's the p-value. And essentially what the p-value is, it's, it's the probability of getting the sample results that you got, okay? Um, if if there's if there's no effect or if there's no result in the population so for example it could be what's the probability of getting the sample correlation that you got if the population correlation is equal to zero okay
Which of the following is a way to say a researcher has rejected the null hypothesis? Okay, and you can clearly see this in the stats uh, videos, the SPSS videos, okay? If you reject the null hypothesis, you must use the word significant, okay? There's a significant relationship between gender and degree of support for same-sex marriage such that, okay? If that's a significant correlation, if P is less than 0.05, if P is greater than 0.05, you're going to say there is not a significant difference between gender and degree of support for same-sex marriage. And at that point, you stop there because there's no relationship. Sorry, let me say that again. If P is greater than 0.05, there is not a significant relationship between gender and degree of support for same-sex marriage. Okay, so this was interesting. This is actually a, a lot to go over. I think, uh, obviously, you read the textbook, so that, that probably helped you, and you probably remembered a lot of this from stats and data analysis, but definitely let me know if you have any questions. <clears throat> okay, so the next thing, I have an announcement regarding the feedback. So you turned in your methods, rough draft, and your results, rough draft, feedback, on Sunday. So I will give you feedback using assignment comments as always. <clears throat> My goal is by Friday, hopefully Thursday. Okay. Once I give you feedback, <clears throat> I will go ahead and send you an email. I also noticed some of you have uh, resubmitted your introduction rough draft. So I will take a look at that as well. After that, the next round of feedback will be your tables and figures and discussion rough draft. That's going to be due on Sunday. And because next week is our final week, I will give you feedback using assignment comments by Wednesday, hopefully Tuesday, which would give you plenty of time to make adjustments for your final paper that's due not this Sunday, but next Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Okay. So definitely let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so lecture, we're on the discussion now. What's the first part of the discussion section of your paper? Okay, well, what did you do before your discussion section? You did the results section. What did you, what did you do in the results section? Okay, you wrote one paragraph explaining each of your analyses that were connected to your hypotheses. Okay, and you use, you know, statistical jargon, okay? Now, the first part of the discussion section is really easy. It's a paragraph, and all you're doing is you're, you're restating your findings, okay, in relation to your hypotheses in a very easy manner to understand. So you're not including any statistical language, you're not including means, you're not including p-values, you're not including any of that. So let's, let's go ahead and take a look at, at how to do it. So again, uh, if you go to the folder, I'm just pulling up our paper overview that we've looked at multiple times. Again, this could be seen as a good template. So what I, what I have here, my note here says, discuss findings in relation to hypotheses and prior studies. Okay. Hold on, I don't, I don't like this. I like this better. So as predicted, what, what do you mean as predicted? Oh, your hypotheses. <laughs> So as predicted, it was found that self-handicapping is negatively related to one's perception of purpose and meaning in life, personal growth, blah, 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 and a bunch of stuff. Also, as predicted, or you can say, uh, you can, so instead of saying as predicted, you, you could say, um, although it was hypothesized that females would support same-sex marriage more than males it was found that there's no no difference there's no you can you can still use the word significant here there uh you you can say you can say um it was found that there's no significant difference between 
uh, gender and support for same-sex marriage. So again, literally you're bringing up, you're kind of looking at your findings in relation to your hypotheses. I think that's the easiest way to say it. So you're either saying as predicted it was found or uh, although it was hypothesized that there that that females would support same-sex marriage more than males um, it was found that there's not a significant difference between males and females on degree of support for same-sex marriage so anyways something simple like that so this should be like about uh, at minimum three sentences okay if you want to add a little explanation maybe a little more but yeah it's pretty short and here's just some examples so okay there's just more examples so you can see okay that's all you're doing there let's take a look at the agenda again so that's the first part of your discussion section so while we're at it let's go ahead and look at the week seven part one discussion and let's see what you're doing there Okay, part one, copy and paste your results paragraphs. And just go ahead and copy and paste that. I know I haven't given you feedback yet. What you can do, I'll give you feedback by Thursday and Friday. You can go back and repost, okay? You can edit your initial post and just drop in, um, you know, it, it, if you have a chance to, to fix it, maybe you don't. So just put in your old stuff, whatever. It's not a big deal. So copy and paste your results paragraphs. Restate the findings from your results section in a way that anyone can understand, okay? And again, I'm saying this is discussion section, first paragraph. Be sure to watch the week seven lecture video, which is this video before you begin. Part three, respond to two other students. Compare their paragraphs to what you learned in the week seven lecture video. Also, please to let, also please let them know if something is unclear and if possible, suggest a correction. Okay, y'all, <laughs> read, their, read their paragraphs, <laughs> right? What did they find? Now, compare that to them restating their findings. First of all, what, what they re restate, does it line up with what their results paragraphs say? Second of all, is uh, does what they restate relate to their hypotheses, right? As we just discussed, and is it clear? Okay, so this is important, right? Because a big part of this discussion board, as I've said before, is an opportunity for peer review. Because as a researcher, we're always bouncing ideas off of each other. We're always reviewing each other's work. So this is a very important. Okay, good. So that's week seven, part one discussion. Okay, so what is the second part or second and third part, if you will, of the discussion section? Limitations in future directions. So let's let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is a this is good. Uh, more detailed limitation sections or section. Okay, so how many limitations do you have to have? You need to have three limitations. Okay, and what's a limitation? Well, let's make it easy. Go back to your participant section. What's the average age? I believe it's nineteen. Is that a limitation of the study? What's the average age of people who live in the United States, of people who live in the state of California? I'm sure it's not 19. So it's a limitation, right? Because maybe if you went out to a senior center, your survey responses would be different. You would find different things. It's very possible that a lot of these findings are based on this young age cohort. 
It's very possible. So yeah, is it a limitation? Oh, sure. Okay, so age, you all could use that as a limitation. Go for it. Okay, what's another limitation? Again, look at the participant section. Ethnic breakdown, okay? UC Riverside in this sample had it had it so 40% of participants in personality and gay marriage attitudes were Asian American. Okay. That's a really high percentage. In what what percentage do Asians make up in the United States in the state of California? I believe it's like 10% or less. Okay. So definitely. Asians are overrepresented in personality and gay marriage attitudes. It's possible, we don't, we don't know, it's possible that if, if we <clears throat> collected uh, a, a data that was more racially representative of the United States or of the state of California, that we might get slightly different responses based on culture, right? Because we all know that culture is a very important factor. So age, race, and another limitation, they're all college students. Well, do you think being a college student could impact how you answer the questions that were included in personality and gay marriage attitudes? Yeah, probably. Because I'll tell you what, not everyone in the United States has a college ed education. I'm not sure the percentage, but I, I'm, it may be 50%, it may be less. So you're excluding a whole group of people. Okay, so age, race, okay, college students. Another one is it, it, it was a convenient sample. So right there, we already know it's not representative of the larger population. And, and second of all, and and sorry, hold on. I have a I have a kid approaching me as I'm trying to film this. Okay, <laughs> so it's a convenient sample. Okay, which is which is not representative of the population, but it is what it is. Okay, but <clears throat> let's talk more about the fact that it's a convenient sample. All students who participated in personality and gay marriage attitudes were taking introduction to psychology. Most of them were psychology majors, although some of them were taking it for a GE requirement, okay? So is it possible that people who would trend towards being a psychology major may answer these questions differently than people who are not psychology majors, let's say engineering majors, okay? So I give you four good limitations. You could think of any other limitations. Okay, but you have four. You can use, you just need three and you can use the ones we talked about or you can come up with your own. But one thing I want you to make sure that you do, note the limitation, but explain why it's a limitation. I don't want you to just say, oh, it's a limitation. Explain why, why is it a limitation? So that's the limitation section. And we'll go down here. See, this is very long, very long limitations. Yours isn't going to be that complicated. Yours should be like a paragraph. And then your, your future research section, which is, you can consider it the third part of your discussion section, should be another paragraph. And, and what's going on here? You're going to address each of the limitations, okay? So how are you going... Pr propose a way to deal with the fact that it's just based on college students, that the average age is 19, that there's a, a really high proportion of Asian Americans, okay? That it's college students, that it's psychology students. That's what you need to come up with for your, your future research section. Okay, so again, how does it work? You state your limitations and then you say, here's how I propose to fix these limitations in our next study. Because if you remember, research is a cyclical process, okay? If this was 
really your research area. You would finish this research paper and then you'd go on to your next study. Okay. Okay. I think that's good. So, oh, some examples of future research. So how would you deal with age? Well, you could collect data outside of the mall. You could go to a senior center. You could try to get away from these college age kids. Okay, so that's one way to deal with age. Uh, race, I think just going out into the community, it's the same thing, collecting data in the community because then you're more likely to uh, get people who that are, you know, uh, or get a get a racial breakdown that's more representative of the community. And also psych, psych, psych major, you know, maybe you would conduct the study uh, in engineering classes, okay? Or, or you would make sure to collect some data from engineering classes or other STEM classes. Anyway, you, be creative with it. I, I know you can do it. So that's good enough. Let's go back to the agenda. Oh yeah, let's look at the week seven, part two discussion. Okay, part one, in a paragraph, state three limitations of the study, personality and gay marriage attitudes, that's your study, and explain why they are limitations. In another paragraph, state three future research directions that should be pursued to address these limitations, okay? And again, this is the discussion section, limitations and future directions section. Be sure to watch the week seven lecture video before you begin, which is this video. Respond to two other students. What limitations did they have in common? Or sorry, <laughs> what limitations did you have in common, if any? What limitations did they discuss that you did not discuss? And based on reviewing what other people did, you can change what you did. What future directions did you have in common, if any? What future directions did they discuss that you did not discuss? If something they discussed worked for you, add it to your paper. Also, please let them know if something is unclear and if possible, suggest a correction. That is compare their paragraphs to what you learned in the week seven lecture video. Okay. Okay, beyond that, so those those discussions are due Sunday by 11.59 p.m. Uh, week seven, uh, sorry, quiz seven, topics 67 through 77. And then your tables, figures, and discussion rough draft. And again, by you simply doing the discussion, you're doing this. <laughs> okay, so your tables and figures, you will need one table, okay, and or figure for each analysis in your results section. You know, it should really say you will need one table or figure. Okay. So literally, so I want you to have a total of three, okay? So for each paragraph of your results section, I want either a table or a figure. Okay. And then regarding the discussion, you're literally doing what we what we just did. Okay. Okay, and then I can give you feedback on that and that's gonna be your last set of feedback as we uh, discussed. Okay, and remember, you need to find and create article summaries for 10 articles, okay? Uh, 
uh, you need for the introduction section of your, of your paper. Again, this is for your literature review section. You need 10 article summaries. So don't forget that. Okay, that's all I have for you. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for bringing us here. We know you have a plan for us, and that is why we're here. Otherwise, we literally would not be here, Lord. Give us a wisdom to humble ourselves and realize that it's no longer us, but you who lives within us if we are Christians. Give us a wisdom to turn to you and to realize what aspects of this class you need us to take in for the plan that you have for us. Lord, give us the strength. And I know you will. You will give us the strength. We can do all things because you strengthen us, Lord. Lord, we pray that your will is done in our lives, that your will is done all around us and in, in everything and in everyone, because we have faith in you and we know that your will is good and we humble ourselves to that will. We ask for protection against Satan and his schemes. We ask for protection against the doctrine of demons. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Uh, class, this is a peace that surpasses all understanding because it comes from our Lord Jesus Christ. He tells us in Matthew, he tells us in other places to give him all of our burdens, all of our traumas, give, give all those to him. Seek him first and everything will fall into place. That is what he promises. Remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Keep your eyes on him. Do his will. For all these intentions, Lord, and the ones that we're holding in our hearts, we pray to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and email me if you have any questions, and I will have office hours. So definitely show up to those this week. I'll send you an email as always. Have a great evening. Take care.